that everything was done properly. Because we move on, we retire, you know, this, in this business, we, we get bought by different companies, you never know where you're going to be, so you always want your documentation to, uh, to stand for itself. And one thing that I've seen over the years is when clinicians make the transition into clinical research, some of the most excellent clinicians out there are not the most excellent clinical researchers because they don't get the, the magnitude of documentation that they're going to become responsible for. Okay, so this is one of the first documents you'll have to fill out. It's called FDA Form 1572, and this essentially contains a slew of information that the sponsor spend, has to send to FDA in order to have the investigator included in the trial. So there's a lot of logistical types of information on there, but what I want to call your attention to is the very last one, which is the statement of the investigator. Um, this will be on the next slide. So I like to call these the nine commitments. When you have your 1572 form, you flip it over to the back. A lot of investigators who have been doing studies for a long time will just apply their signature because they're used to signing it, but I always like to bring them back to to really see what they're committing to. So the first thing they're doing is committing to follow the protocol. A lot of these are things Amy told you already, and to keep the sponsor informed of any changes in the research. And of course, to, that pretty much goes without saying, we should always have this in the back of our heads that our job is to protect the safety, rights, and well-being of subjects. Uh, there's an a requirement to personally conduct or supervise the investigation and this is where clinical investigators are really getting slammed <coughs> nowadays for being absentee or phantom investigators. That's very critical. They are responsible for informing their subjects in no uncertain terms that they are taking an experimental drug, so there are definite risks associated with that. And, and they have to ensure that, uh, that um, informed consent is obtained. Yeah, so I'm actually not going to read every single one of these to you because these are, uh, I think Amy's got over these somewhat, but let's go to the next <coughs> one. And that's just what I, what I want to call out to you. In the United States, it is a federal offense to violate this. Okay, so let's do a little quick and dirty talk about some of the consequences that occur when you don't conduct a clinical trial compliantly. So the truth, these are the investigator responsibilities, and the consequences are the things that can happen to you after FDA inspects you, or another regulatory authority, and, and decides they don't like what they see. So they'll, they will request actions if required, and if they're serious actions, these will show up in what's called a warning letter. So let's take a look at this first warning letter here. So this is um, this is related to consent. There was um, at the site there was somebody who was not the subject signing the signature for them, which is considered a serious thing because if a subject gives free informed consent, they we need to have proof that they did it themselves. And not using updated consent forms is, is also an issue. So this is something that this investigator was cited for in a warning letter. And let's skip the next one. We'll go to the one that says medical care of subjects. So this is your classic phantom PI, phantom principal investigator. This is somebody who committed blatant fraud and said he was in the office taking care of patients and doing assessments when he wasn't. And there was a preponderance of evidence to that effect. And the take-home message here is that even though this is a documentation issue, sloppy or negligent work leads inspectors and auditors to, to question whether the investigator has adequate resources to, to conduct the trial. Okay. Yeah, okay, there's, there's a couple of uh, critical ones I want to bring out. So, the, okay, so this next one here, yeah, this one, um, this one is actually very important because there was a miscalculated dose and these subjects are all overdosed. Now, luckily, there wasn't a serious outcome, but that doesn't mean 
you're not going to get cited for it because it could potentially lead to something serious if it, if it doesn't recur. Or if it doesn't recur. Okay, so this is fairly straightforward. Now, um, IRB approval expired three times, so you might think that that would be a citation to the Investigational Review Board for not maintaining their approval of the trial, but it's the investigator's responsibility to submit the approval. So the implication and risk here is that there is an adequate safety and subject welfare oversight when that happens. Okay, so the next one is compliance with the investigational plan. And this is actually a response from a site to a warning letter. They, they received the warning letter, they wrote back to FDA. And the message here is, if you do get into this situation and you need to respond to a health authority, the response isn't this. You know, they, they don't want to hear that. The IRB didn't tell me, the sponsor didn't tell me, you're the one whose name is on that 1572. So you're the one who's responsible. Okay, and let's go to the one after this, because this, this is really a critical one. So FDA also issues something called a NIDPO letter, which is notification of intent of initiation of disqualification proceedings and opportunity to explain. NIDPO. <laughs> And so these are, this is when an investigator is going to be disqualified and possibly pro prosecuted. And this investigator was so egregious with the protocol that he actually killed a child. So, the, yeah. So, you know, the, 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 these are serious, serious things. And actually just this week, I think on April 12th, there was an article in the New York Times about putting some of the trust back into the patients to let them report what their adverse event systems are or symptoms are because there's there's a feeling out there, I think it was a, also a an EJM article that, that talked about how the doctors are not really obtaining enough information and we're starting to have an issue of underreporting of side effects and, and adverse events. And that article was called In Reporting Systems, Don't Patients Know Best? So I thought that was pretty good. Okay, so this Next one, this is actually a statement from the FDA on one of the sites that I put up earlier. And I really liked how they, they summed this up. So this was the investigator who was doing the blame everybody else except me, I'm not accountable. And they said, ultimate responsibility for accurate and complete implementation, implementation of the protocol should lie with the investigator rather than with the staff. Um, this investigator has said, I'm going to use this new guidance to train people. And FDA's response was, I'm going to train people is not a response. You have to say how you're going to train people and how you're going to monitor the effectiveness of that training. And they said here, as a clinical investigator, you may delegate study tasks to, another, to other qualified personnel, but you may not delegate your responsibility. And that's really the, the critical message that as a clinical investigator, you, know, you have to always be responsible. You have to know what's going on in your study at all times. Okay, so the next slides are just a few references that I wanted to point out to you, and particularly the third one. If anybody remembers the Jesse Gelsinger case, it's about 10 years ago. There was a kid, very healthy kid, who was in a gene therapy study and he actually died and there was a whole contract of, conflict of financial interest and not a, kind of a black mark on the clinical research field in general. But the lawyer for the Gelsingers, Alan Milstein, who um, is maybe not a favorite person in the industry, actually maintains an excellent website about clinical trials litigation and how to keep yourself out of trouble as an investigator. So I highly recommend that. And then on the next page, these are two things that I consider require I consider required reading for anybody who's going to participate in a clinical trial. They're all the Belmont report is actually from the 70s, and it's essentially a foundational document that delineates the difference between medical practice and clinical research. So that's 
a good one to read. And we <coughs> mentioned the Declaration of Helsinki before. That's that's an important one. Okay, so finally, if you want to go out and conduct a clinical trial, how can you comply with these guidelines? We've reiterated that line again from FDA because I don't think we can say that any more perfectly than they did. So the first thing to do is make sure the staff you're using are qualified by training and experience and that you can document this. Work closely with the IRB to make sure all the ethical requirements are, are being met. Obtain informed consent properly if the subjects haven't given free and willing informed consent to participate in the trial, you've violated their rights. And as we said before, there's lots of information to record, so make sure you do that. Always be sensitive to confidentiality. We actually have some laws about that right now that we won't go into, but if you have insurance anywhere, it's, the, it's called HIPAA, you're probably familiar with it. Maintain proper control of the investigational products, so make sure they're locked, limited access, is stored in appropriate conditions, and that you can track where they go from the time they arrive at the clinical site till the time they go back to the sponsor. Follow all the regulatory reporting requirements, and I could spend a week talking to you about implementing quality systems, but. Uh, after putting all of these other procedures in place, if you don't take it upon yourself to check out that, make that to make sure everything's working, then you're doing yourself a, a great disservice. So in conclusion, if you are going to conduct a clinical trial, it's incredibly rewarding, it's exciting, it's gratifying, but you always really have to maintain that mindset that we are working under the umbrella of these regulations and that we're not just following rules because we're there. There are really very valid scientific and ethical foundations that, that motivate you to do this. So what questions do you have about? We don't have any time. We don't have any time. I'm we don't so have sorry today. Um, thank you so much. Let me, please. Uh, join me in thanking Amy and Michelle for the.